Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining me tonight. Uh, my name is George Dad. I'm the current CCBA president, and uh, I'm excited to spend the next hour or 90 minutes talking to you about something that's become sort of top of the mind for me about uh, hive inspections and a particular type of hive inspections called sort of informative hive inspections, like how to think about your hive inspection in a certain way that allows you to make key management decisions from the information you gather. Uh, so we used to do a lot more of these in the past. So I, I, I wanna start by saying that, you know, any CCBA member who, who, who thinks they have something to present to the group, uh, surely Donna would like to hear from you at meetings, but sometimes, you know, we can do stuff outside of meetings too. So if, so, if there's somebody on the, on the Zoom tonight who wants to talk about a particular topic or something like that, just let me know. And, and surely we, we'd like to do more of these Zooms in between meetings. So again, everybody's welcome to, to present. Uh, a little bit of background on myself and why this topic has become sort of uh, important to me is that prior to about three or four years ago, I was an academic pediatrician. So part of most of my job was involved in in teaching residents, pediatric residents, how to sort of take care of, of sick kids in the hospital, right? So they they were with me for three years where, you know, I was given the opportunity to, to teach them how to assess and how to make management decisions. Uh, and this was important, right? Because this is like, surely beekeeping is not pediatric health, right? So there's, there's, there's definitely two, two, they're not trying to equate those two by any means, but, uh, there was a process, you know, and it, and it generally took the residents three years to learn how to do that process. Uh, and some were better after th at the end of three years than others, right? So, uh, you know, it was important for me to to teach them because eventually at night, the, the most senior person in the hospital was often the third year resident at a certain point, right? At some point, the attendings get to go home. You figure like, okay, everything's stable. Uh, whatever time it is, eight, nine, 10 o'clock, you're going to go home and get to sleep because you're no longer a resident. But then you leave the residents in the hospital at night. Some of you know, some of you in, in healthcare probably understand that, you know, and, and have been in the in those scenarios. Well, that's a that's when the blank hits the fan often, you know, you know, and 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 you learn, you kind of learn quickly who who which residents you can trust and not because you know, they'd call you up at night and they give you, a, they start talking to you about what's going on. And some would present in a very organized, understandable fashion and then tell you what they need to do. And some would call you, oh, this kid's sick. I don't know what to do. I was like, no, you got to fill me in with a little bit more information. You know, I mean, please let's back it up and go through the process. Right. And sometimes they were able to go through the process and arrive at a decision. And sometimes it's one o'clock in the morning and I'm throwing on my clothes and getting back in my car to see what's going on, you know? So I, I, I feel like, and you know, in beekeeping, there's no training, you know, you get a, you get a hive. A lot of you got your hive all in the last couple of weeks. If you're a new beekeeper, you've gotten a package or you've gotten a new, you shook the bees into the box and now you're responsible for their, for their management. And, and that's, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, I never, I never want a first year resident responsible for anything in the hospital at any point. So, you know, it's a, so I'm going to hopefully present a, a way to think about your hive inspections and what questions you want to answer from them. Now, none of this is going to be the end all be all of any, making anyone a great beekeeper, right? So making yourself a great beekeeper, um, just like uh, uh, making the, the, the residents that ended up being phenomenal residents, they read, they showed up, and they wanted to be involved, right? That, that's what made a good resident, honestly. They, they, they read their stuff. They knew their stuff. They wanted to get involved, you know, and, and, and they, they, they grew. And the same way with beekeeping. It, it takes years to really become proficient at this, you know, even good beekeepers. And I'll admit it. You know, I, I, those of you who know me well know I'll I'll be the first one to stand up and tell you all the stupid things I've done in my beekeeping over the years. And I've made some mistakes over the past year, some pretty big mistakes over the past year, honestly, on management decisions. So even even experienced beekeepers make management decision mistakes that oftentimes result in the hives dying. Right. So I, I think if you're really good if you're really, really good 
about your management decisions, you probably should have about a 10% hive loss every year. Now that kind of doesn't mean much if you're running three hives, right? I mean, you know, that you could lose one hive and then be 33%, but the reality is, you know, even myself would have lost that hive. So, in, but in general, over time, you should not lose a lot of highs if you're uh, uh, really skilled at, at assessing and managing your hive. So with that as an introduction, again, thank you for being here. I'm going to present the slides and then we will um, obviously, uh, if anybody has questions, type them in the chat. But I'll tell you, I'm flying this alone tonight. So I'll probably read through the chat questions at the end of the talk. So just type them in the chat or hold on to them and we'll get to them. So what's the purpose of a hive inspection? Uh, hive inspections in, uh, are essential part of keeping bees. You, you, you generally don't keep bees in a hive and, and just let them be. Uh, there, there may be some people that are practicing more natural beekeeping and maybe try to go into their hives less. But I even think natural beekeepers would agree that they need to go into hives and see what's going on. Um, hives, if you don't want to do, uh, if you don't want to get into your hives and mess with bees, you probably should leave them, leave, let them live in trees. Uh, part of the hive inspection is assess what's going on with the colony, what's going on inside the hive and then therefore inform you what to do. Uh, a lot of it is observational. You know, a lot of it is learning. And ultimately, this is a hobby for 99% of the people in the CCBA. And I would say almost 100% of the people in the CCBA, it's a hobby. Some of us would like to think we're making some money off beekeeping. Maybe. <laughs> a lot of us are spending money on beekeeping. Maybe some of us are making some money on beekeeping. But I think ultimately it's a hobby. You know, most of us are, have earned our income in some other way or earned some other thing. So you want to be able to say I'm having fun doing this because it because it is a hobby. So what's an informative like I'm, I'm calling this informative inspections. Why is it a formative different than a, just a regular old hive inspection? Because when I'm thinking about informative, I want to collect information that's useful. You know, sometimes the residents at night would be telling me about the kids in fourth grade and gets all A's. I was like, yeah, that's nice. But, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're two o'clock in the morning and the kids, you know, dying. I don't know if I need to hear about his social life at 2 a.m. But so you want to sort of think about information that's usable useful and information that's actionable like can i do something about the information that i'm collecting and lastly which is a little bit harder to appreciate when you first start is information that assesses performance right so you're kind of assessing performance of both the honeybees and the beekeeper honestly in some ways so what's going on in this colony is this a good colony? Is this a good queen? Is this not a good queen? Is this a strong colony and not a good colony? Was this a right decision as a beekeeper, not a right decision? So that's all information driven, but you have to know what to collect. So that's why I'm calling it information. Now, everyone's going to say this to themselves in their head a thousand times. So when I talk about assessment, there's four things you want to assess when you go into your hive. Bees, brood, food, and disease. Bees, brood, food, and disease. So when you open that hive to when you close that hive, you should not close that hive until you're able to answer or assess or tell me or tell yourself or tell somebody about these four things in that hive. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about what, how you describe and what you're looking for, but it's bees, brood, food, and disease. It sort of rhymes or something like that. So remember, it'll, we'll come back to it. Now, there's four management decisions that are crucial. So I'm throwing the hard stuff up front. It's going to come back at you, but you don't have to remember it right now. But these are the four questions that will keep your hive alive. Number one question, is the size of your hive appropriate for the size of the colony? It's a very important thing, and it doesn't get talked enough about, right? So those of you who just got bees, hopefully when you got your package of bees that covers three or four frames, or when you got your nuke, that covers four or five frames, you didn't load up all your boxes and put the little tiny starter colony in all these boxes. You know, I've seen it done. You know, that's too much, too much size, right? 
But hopefully if you start your colony in a small box, when it starts to grow, you increase the size. So we'll get into how to make that decision. But number and number one is, is the hive the right size? Number two is, is your colony queen right? Number three, does the colony need to be fed? And number four is, what is the mite count and intervention needed? So think bees, brood, food, and disease, right? They're the four things you need to assess. So you can kind of see how you're going to answer these four questions. If you assess the bees, you'll be able to answer, is the hive appropriate? If you assess, assess the brood, you'll be able to assess if you're queen right. Assess the food, does the colony need to be fed? And do you have disease? What's your mite intervention? So when to inspect, when to do a, a, an inspection. Um, ideal conditions for an inspection or basically today minus the minus the uh, the eclipse right so you want you want your temperature to be 60 degrees you want a bright and sunny day and if you're retired midday is ideal uh just because all the foragers are out and all the nurse bees are back and the hives generally easier to work midday what you want to avoid and sometimes you can't avoid if you're if you're running on a tight schedule, you want to avoid cloudy or rainy days, colder days, late in the day. You don't want to be wearing your black socks or just coming off, you know, having any sense on you because you're going to be more likely to have a difficult hive inspection, right? It's a lot easier to have a hive, uh, an informative hive this inspection where you're not getting lit up by bees, right? So it, it, <laughs> even I... If a hive's nasty, I'm unlikely going to assess a very informative inspection. I just want to close it up and get out of there. So, but I think I think for the most part, if you if you pick your time correctly, you can have a nice condition to do a hive inspection. How often do you need to do a hive inspection? Um, you know, th this is the time of the year, like March through May, where a lot of the key sort of decisions are being made. So you want to be in there more frequently. Surely once the, the, the swarm season's done and the nectar flow is, is over, like in the summer, um, you know, maybe a little bit less frequently. And surely uh, once uh, winter comes, you, you really don't need to be in your hives very often. Uh, now, is there a problem with going into hives too much? You know, because some new beekeepers and, and practice makes perfect, right? You're only going to be good at a hive inspection if you go in there and, and do it. Uh, probably not. You know, every time you go into a hive, you do you do put there is a consequence of going into a hive. You know, you have to disturb it. You're at risk for injuring the queen. Uh, the, the organization of that hive is probably set back a little bit and their foraging ability and, and what the work they're doing in the hive. So, but it's probably not going to necessarily compromise the, the ultimate survivability or function of that hive if you go in there too much. So probably not. Uh, can you go in there too less? Absolutely. You know, you could leave your hive in the back and, and not look at it for a couple months. And, and that's probably not the best idea of, of your management. So, when I when I told the when I taught the residents before you do in a procedure before you do something the last thing you want to do is and we used to do a lot of spinal taps you know and I said you know the last thing you want to do is go do a spinal tap and not have the right size needle that's not a good situation when you're trying to do your 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 work in the middle of the night you know and and sometimes you're just sort of running around and you're tired and and, and you forget something well. Same way with going out to your hive inspection. There are some very basic tools that you want to have uh, to make it effective. And you don't want to leave any of them at home for sure. So one is uh, some kind of protective equipment. I'm kind of known uh, for wearing not enough protective equipment. But what you don't see is that I always have all my protective equipment close by. So if I need to put on a jacket, I have it. But usually a veil is going to be enough for me. So you want some sort of protective equipment. A hive tool is essential. It's hard to work a hive, no matter what hive you have without a hive tool. A good smoker. Uh, I never, well, I shouldn't say I never, because I do. Uh, but when I'm going out to work a yard, I always have my smoker lit. It's usually the first thing I do when I get to a yard is light my smoker uh, and have it close by. Uh, it becomes your friend, uh, especially if you're dealing with a hive that isn't very calm. I'm a big fan of a quiet box. So a quiet box is basically a nuke box with a number eight hardware cloth on the bottom. 
Uh, you could put a you could put a outer cover on the bottom too. It's just somewhere that when you when you find when you find the queen during during an inspection or you find a frame that you want to take a closer look at, it's just nice to sort of be able to put something in the quiet box, you know. So I I, I oftentimes when doing a hive inspection, when I find the frame with the queen, that frame will go in the quiet box when I do the rest of the inspection, just because I don't need to obsess as much about you know, rolling her or dropping her when I know she's in that quiet box. So I'm a fan. Um, um, you want some sort of record keeping. I, I know people are smirking at me a little bit because I was not a record keeper for a long time. So I'll admit it. I I, I went back and I, I, I found this, I found this like nice journal that I had for my first year of beekeeping at all my highs and all my inspections. And it was all written out pages and pages. And then I, and then I stopped doing it. And now they're back, right? So now I have very abbreviated hive notes. And the reason for that is because uh, it said part of informative hive inspections is assessing the colony, right? And and in order to assess the colony, you have to assess it over time. And my brain can't remember one colony for the next. So my notes are are, are more sort of assessing the, the, the hive quality or the performance of that hive. Uh, more so than anything. And every once in a while, I'll write a note like I made this intervention or that intervention. So I know what to do the next time I go in. So I've become a pretty big proponent of Hive Notes. Um, <clears throat> some people use apps. I'm not that technologically advanced or, or advanced in any way. So I still write my Hive Notes out, but there's lots of Lots of apps, and maybe we can get someone to share which ones they like, because uh, I'm sure there's some real good ones out there. So that's it. That's your basic to be prepared. And again, the more prepared you are, the more successful you'll be, and the more fun you'll have. Uh, here's I, I did a little I did a little TikTok video, uh, you know, my my on how to light a smoker. So let's go back and. Uh, whoops, let me. All right, so today George is going to show Amber here how to light a smoke. Can you guys hear this? George, what's your secret recipe? A little bit of paper. A little yeah. bit of paper. A little paper. The bottom. A little bit of uh, chemical-free burlap. A little bit of burlap. Layer. So you like to layer it. Layer it is the key. Layering it, layering is the key to success. Uh, pine needles don't make a difference what kind of pine needles, but pine needles work really well. Nice smoke. My favorite secret ingredient, sumac bud. Uh, highly important. <laughs> Nothing's highly we important. We got a mix, a little, a little, a little seasoning mix here of uh, wood chips and, and pellets. Highly oh, recommend yeah. pellets, wood pellets, grass pellets, all kinds yeah, of pellets. Just toss it all in there. Toss it all in, and then at the very top, we got some green. Make sure it's cool smoke. So we got some nice greens at the top. Make sure you put green yeah. at the top. It's going to cool that cow. smoke out. And it's also going to prevent it from flying yeah. out embers. Oh, so. Here comes the moment to see whether or not this works, Amber. Got this, Amber's Amber. got the torch. Go big or go home, right? <laughs> so we're going to light this smoke from the outside. He's going to torch it so it's nice and red. A nice red so he gets a, a red spot. And this is going to go up and down. And then I'm going to smoke Ooh. the Ooh. smoker. Okay, Amber, I think we're good. Wow. Looks good. Looks great. <laughs> and we just couple give it a couple big smokes, a couple big ones. But again, we lit it. Amber lit it from the bottom, so it's going to burn from the bottom up. And I think this smoke is going to be lit for about an hour. Good job, Amber. Awesome job. <laughs> so there's lots of ways to light it. There's lots of ways to light a smoker, but... Uh, your your your, your smoker is going to be your friend during your hive inspection. So make sure you have a a smoker. I usually when I get to the uh, get to the site, every hive gets a puff of smoke before I go into it. And really, a well lit smoker should really last the whole the the whole uh, time you're inspecting. So if your smoker is going out, practice, practice, practice. <laughs> so. So the first thing I used to teach the residents about when you approach a sick kid. Before you before you like start with your stethoscope or your otoscope or whatever you're going to do, you want to take a moment and get a general appearance of what's going on. This sort of like step back and just sense like, is this kid OK or not? You know, and, and that's going to be so valuable. It's not going to tell you what's right or what's wrong. You're still going to need to do the physical exam. 
but it's going to give you a sense. In the same way, when you approach your hive from the outside, take a moment. It should be strapped. I say that, and the raccoons destroyed hives of the ape here because I didn't have them strapped right, but they were strapped. But is your hive strapped? What is the hive configuration? What is the boxes? Is it one deep, two deep? What? Because you're going to have to answer that question eventually, right? Is the size of my hive right? So you want to take a moment and say, what's the size of my hive? Is there a queen excluder? What's directly beneath the bottom board? You know, the bees are constantly cleaning house, right? They keep a clean house. So you can notice that in most of my hives, I'm not going to say all, but in most of my hives, the ground is scalped right underneath the hive. So right underneath the hive, you won't find any grass. It's just dirt. And the reason for that is, is because I want to see what's dropping out of that hive when I come into the yard. So if I see pupae, if I see dead bees, that, that's a sign. I'm going to look at the amount of bee traffic coming in and out and kind of compare it if there are other hives in the apiary. How does it compare to the other hives? Is there pollen coming in? Not that, not that pollen coming in means that you're queen right, but you'd like to see pollen coming in. Is the ratio of workers to drones okay? Are all the bees coming back into this hive drones? Are they mainly workers? And is it different from the rest of the hives in, in the apiary? Um, uh, so this is just a, a a quick picture of just normal kind of activity on the uh, on coming out the landing board. Uh, nothing special, but uh, kind of what you'd expect. You want to take a look at your landing board. You know, most of the hives, not all of them, some of the horizontal hives don't have a landing board, but most of the Langstroth hives have a landing board. And that's that two or three inch space that the bees land on before going into the hive. And sometimes it provides clues to what's going on, right? In the fall, do you see a lot of yellow jackets going in and out of your hive? That's not a good sign, right? You should see honeybees going in and out of your hive. If you see a lot of yellow jackets, you're going to start to at least generate a hypothesis that maybe I don't have enough bees in that hive. Or maybe my bees are super friendly that they just yet let the yellow jackets in. Again, drones do come in and out of the hive. They have to fly. And yeah, drones generally fly in early afternoon, but it's still a minority of the bees that are coming in and out of the hive are drones. Most of them are workers, right? Inside a hive, 90% of the bees are workers, 10% of the drones. So if you look at if you look at the entrance and you see 50-50, you should think. Um, robbers is a is a is a classic one to to that takes a little bit of time to recognize robbers versus regular bees, and we're not going to spend much time on that tonight. But again, uh, something that you'll uh, that you'll notice if you see it, and obviously you don't want to see dead bees. A few dead bees are okay on the bot on the landing board. Surely bees die and inside the hive, and there's a, a you know there's an undertaker that cleans them out, but you don't want to see a lot for sure. And then we already talked about on the ground. I really, you know, you could put a you could put a, a stone underneath there. You could put a piece of carpet or a cardboard or whatever. I just take my weed whacker and scalp it because I'm not that organized. I find it useful just to see it. It's just to see if they're they're dropping anything out of that hive. And I, I was showing something on this hive. I think that this, that this was some pupae dropped out, and and I think that this may have been some chilled brood. Honestly, that ended up because the 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 something they didn't have enough bee coverage and i think they were dropping some pupae now you could see that on hygienic bees you could see that on high beetles it doesn't tell you what's going on but if you start to see the pupae on the on the ground in front of the hive it it should raise suspicion some people use whiteboards i tend to use more solid bottom boards so i'm not a huge screen bottom board whiteboard uh uh user but those there's some people that are that are really good at uh at you know pulling out it's kind of cool right before you go into a hive you just pull out the whiteboard and you see what's there and, and it can give you some clues you know surely you could look at uncappings that's what you want to see right because bees are always either uncapping honey or the broods being uncapped when it chewed out when it emerges uh sometimes you could see mites on on the whiteboard surely you could see small hive beetles and and it took me a while to recognize it's amazing what wax moth poop looks like this is a it actually looks like mouse turds almost. It's amazing how wax, how big the poop are of wax moth larvae. So you can see the brown cylindrical sort of things that you would initially think that was mice poop, but it's really not. It's it's wax moth. So this was a hive that I think had some wax moth damage going on. So I'm not a big whiteboard user, but if you're using them, take a look at it. Now we the the whole idea, just like 
a general appearance is it's just to generate a hypothesis, right? You're not anything is really diagnostic from looking outside a hive, uh, but it can notice which hive is different. It can slow yourself down. Make sure make sure you just sort of smoke all the hives. Take a moment to observe all the hives before you just sort of dive in and start ripping open hives. But it does not replace the the hive inspection because you do have to open your hives to manage your hives. You can't do it from the outside. Okay, so we're prepared. We looked outside, and now we're going to get into our hive. So here's the moment of truth, and you're going to go back to I need to I need to assess four things. I need to assess bees, brood, food, and disease. So let's talk about bees. Uh, as soon as you open a hive, you're going to see bees. Hopefully, uh, you may not, uh, um, and, and you're going to notice something as soon as you open the hive about the bees. You're going to know. Uh, sort of what those bees sound like, what those bees temperament are. Uh, as soon as you open that hive, it's worth it's worth noting, right? Because this is the assessment part of is is this a hive that I like, or is this a hive that I don't like working because they're awfully defensive. And and not to say one one time uh, labels a hive as being defensive, but surely if you go in there two weeks and in two weeks they act the same, uh, and you could listen to the sound of the hive and look at the bees and see how many frames they cover. So this is an average hive, nothing special about the, this colony at all. Uh, you could see that you can see the bees uh, in the, in the seams of the frames and the, and it's not a quiet colony, but it's not a very loud colony either. So the next thing you want to do is you want to assess the quantity, uh, the quantify the amount of bees in the hive. Um, and, and that's generally referred to as frames or seams of bees, right? So when, when you when you hear people describe this, this is how many frames or how many seams of bees. And seams is the spaces in between the frames. So you can count how many spaces are filled with bees, or you can just generally look at the frames and say uh, that there are seven frames out of 10 that have bee coverage on them. Uh, ideally, bees cover at least 70% of the frames on a, in a hive, right? So if you're if you open a hive and half the hive is uncovered by bees, that's less than ideal. If you open a hive and every single frame has bees on it and the bees are rolling out of the hive, that may not be ideal. Uh, remember, there are about 2000 uh, bees per frame if the frame is covered with brood. So if you're trying to do a that's a deep frame, not a medium frame. So if you're trying to do a quick assessment of how many bees are in that hive you know it, you can count the frames of bees and multiply by 2000 and you'll get how many bees are in the hive and, and a frame of cap brood uh both sides uh if, if you have a frame of cap brood that's that brood on both sides when that brood emerges it'll cover about three frames so just just sort of to think ahead a little bit you know a deep frame uh when emerged uh, we'll have about 6,000 bees emerge on that deep frame if it's covered in brood. So just to think ahead about, you know, you're doing a hive inspection this week, but, you know, if you see if you see four or five frames of fully capped brood, it gives you a sense of how many how much bee coverage that that brood is going to take up in, in a few weeks when it emerges. Uh, so the general appearance of the bees, uh, bees behave very differently, right? So if you look at enough colonies, you're going to notice that the behavior, the behavior on the bees is very different from colony to colony. Uh, ideally, when you pull that frame out of that hive, you want calm, very calm, purposeful, confident bees, right? You don't want runny bees. You don't want loud bees. You don't want smelly bees. You know, you want calm bees. You almost want to feel like the bees don't even care that you're there, honestly. Uh, and again, that's worth noting. Again, when it comes back to assessing the hive, you want bees that are really calm. You can look at the, these bees. You know, they're they're moving around, but they're not they're not running. They're not all hyped up or running all over the place. They're quiet, calm bees. Worth noting. Um, here's another colony. This is I was telling uh, uh, Jim before we got started. This is a colony, this fascinating story a little bit. At least I think it's fascinating. This was a hive that, that was at, at an out yard for the last two years. So 
You know, I have a bunch of out yards. This hive was sitting at an out yard. And I know it was a daughter uh, from one of my breeder, my breeder queens. So I, I, I knew she was a daughter. She was marked and I knew she was there for two years. So, you know, this was her second year that she survived the winter. And she was always super calm, right? And and I thought to myself, well, why don't you know? I like to I like to breed. I like to graft calm bees. I like I like calm bees in my apiary. Uh, this may end up being my breeder this year, right? So look at that. Like they they were like, whoops, they were like, they're like they're like it's like on the beach in Acapulco or something. They're just like just like totally chill. I was like, wake up, you know? So I was like, okay, this hive, if it survives, so I had in my mind last fall, this hive, it's, if it survives the winter, it's going to come back to my home yard because it's going to be my breeder, right? It's it survived two years. It's calm. So it survived the winter, early March. It's still in one box. I bring it back to my home apiary. I was like, okay, you're going to be my breeder. You sit there. The last two times I've been in this hive, it's lit me up. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on here? You know, and I'm trying to think, it's like, are they unhappy that they have a new location? It's the same queen. She's marked. So I don't know. Anyway, but, you know, this, this is interesting because this is my home apiary is right on a road. So I was like, are they really upset that I've moved them, you know, from where they were to where they are now? Who knows what it is? But anyway, uh, here, here's a, here's a, what are these bees? You know, we talked about bees. You know, you, you surely want to look at how many bees, but you also want to look at, you know, the temperament, but you also want to look at what bees are doing, right? Because bees are cool. You know, let's take a look. Let's take a look at well, that bee. You know what that is, right? That that bee on the left is like a oh, waggle. It's like doing that waggle dance and doing that figure eight, you know? There's a queen down there. Look at that queen. So that's the waggle dance. You know, that's usually uh, in, in where the where the brood is, where the pollen is. You know, they're telling all the other all the other uh, foragers, which way to go. I can't interpret what the waggle dance is. Uh, Tom Seeley could help you with that. And that's been described, not too cool, but it's cool to see, but this was cool. So this is, this is a hive on the right. So this is a hive that has an observation window in it, right? So I'm able to look into the brood nest through this observation window, right? So without opening the hive, I'm able to, to see the top bars of the frames without other brood frames without opening up so take a look at this you notice anything let's do that one more time that bee right in the middle look at what that bee's doing right in the middle i don't know some of you may recognize it to me that looked like washboarding right so I always thought like, hey, washboarding always occurs on the outside surface of the hive, right? They're outside of the entrance. It's usually happening when the in the middle, when the humidity starts to pick up and they kind of go up and down behavior on the outside of the hive, right? I'm looking at this bee that's sitting. So this bee's doing the same behavior with its front legs going back and forth right on the top bar. So this bee's washboarding the top bar too. So I was like, okay, well, washboarding's just not a, not a outside the hive thing. It's an inside the hive thing. Now I told you you should observe things that are actionable, right? Well, this is not actionable, right? So, but this is cool. I thought I'd show you something that was a little cool, maybe not actionable. That that's that they're washboarding inside the hive on wood too. So it's has something else to do besides uh, something else is going on when they're doing that. Maybe it's just neurotic behavior on bees. Maybe they just a little obsessive and they just have to clean. And they just if there's a wood surface, they go back and forth over the wood surface. I don't know. But no one understands exactly what washboarding is, you know. But I'm convinced now it's it's not happening just outside the hive. It's happening inside the hive. So, again, we opened our hive. we got to quantify the, the amount of bees. We're going to look at what the bees are doing. We're going to look at the, the general appearance of the bees. But the question really that's important is, do I need to change the size of my hive? Does it need to be smaller? i.e. it's going into winter, coming out of winter, post-swarm. It's got a small hive beetle infestation. The hive is too big. It's too big. You know, the bees go, coming out of winter at about 10,000 bees. Basically, hopefully, not my hives, but most hives are going to reach about 60,000 bees kind of mid-May. 
and then they're going to go down to 10,000 bees in winter. To me, that means you got to change the size of the hive as it's, as the colony changes. One of the major things that I think people get into trouble with as new beekeepers is their hive grows, they make it big, they don't know how to do swarm control, the bees swarm, and then they're left with this small hive, small colony, and a big hive that they don't reduce and then they and then high beetles move in, and then it just is the downfall to 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 why new beekeepers lose so many hives. And that's preventable, right? You can't prevent your hive from swarming, but you can definitely take a post swarm hive and make it smaller. Now there are times that you need to go big, right? There are times when you need to go big for sure. When the nectar flow is on in May, I assume the nectar is going to flow at some point this year. Not recently, but it looks like. Today was a little bit better, but rain's coming back. But obviously, you know, go big when the nectar flows on. You know, when you got a growing package or a growing nuke, get larger. But again, do I need to change the size of the hive to the number of bees? Okay, bees brood. The second one is brood. Uh, if you work with Jeff Eckel, Jeff Eckel's rule is I need to see three frames of brood. I think that's a good rule. You know, you want to, you don't need to see every frame of brood, but three frames of brood will give you a good understanding of what's going on. When you're looking at brood, you, you're both looking at the quantity of brood and the quality of brood. So there's three kinds, there's three kinds of uh, uh, stages of brood, right? There's the egg. Uh, eggs are hard to see. Uh, I, I tell people they look like a grain of rice. Uh, initially, they're standing straight up. And then they lay down when they emerge to into a larvae. Uh, eggs are are there for three days. Uh, if 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 your vision's not great or if you're not using black plastic, they can be hard to see. Uh, larvae are six days, so larvae are basically the worm or, or the grub. Uh, you could see the progression of the of the stages of larvae uh, on this slide. So you could see at the top their eggs. And then the larvae kind of uh, are C-shaped, uh, are comma-shaped, and then C-shaped. And then they basically get a circle uh, 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 and, and nice and fat. And, and that's six days. And then, they're, and then they pupate or they cocoon for 12 days. So it's easy to remember basically three, six, 12, double each one, three days in an egg, six days in a larvae, and 12 days is a pupae. And you should be able to see all three stages of brood when you go into a hive to inspect. Now, a lot of people say they can't see eggs. That is true. Uh, and 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 if, if your vision is uh, like mine, not great, you know, sometimes it's hard, right? So uh, using black plastic foundation sometimes will help. So on your brood frames, I, I use black plastic foundation just to help myself out a little bit. And you want to inspect with the sun at your back. Uh, but honestly, oftentimes I'm just looking for royal jelly. So when I look at that frame, I'm just looking for that milky, shiny stuff that's on the bottom of the cell. And that's on day one larvae, you know, so you'll see royal jelly on day one larvae uh, and you won't see, you won't even see the larvae in there. But if you see that, you probably have eggs somewhere. So again, this is in a grafting cup. So this, I, this, I, this is grafting. So this, I took the larvae and, and, uh, the royal jelly out, but that's what's in the bottom of of the cell is, is just that pool of pool of royal jelly, uh, and that's a we won't get in, into the details, but that's also a good way to sort of assess the nutrition of your hive is to look at the amount of royal jelly. You know, if, if your hive is not making great royal jelly, it's nutritionally not adequate. If if, if your royal jelly looks like that, you're in great shape. Uh, and like I said, uh, seeing lung, young larvae is often good good enough if you can't see eggs. So most of us are familiar with the two brood types in a hive. There's basically worker brood and there's drone brood. Uh, the worker brood is flat. The drone brood is bullets. Uh, you're going to, again, see a 90, you know, 90 percent should be worker brood. 10 percent should be drone brood. Uh, most of the drone brood, and unless you put a green frame, which forces them to lay drone brood, most of the drone brood is going to be on the outside of the brood nest. So you're going to see it on the outside frames. You're going to see it on the bottom of the frames generally. Uh, so, uh, why they stick the why they stick the drone on the outside? Maybe they're maybe they're able to because they're a little fatter, able to tolerate colder temperatures a little bit or cooler temperatures. So they go on the outside of the nest versus the worker brood on the center of the nest. Uh, 
I, I went into a hive today and I was like, the first frame I pulled was 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 drone brood. I said, okay, this is the outside of the nest. But it had a lot of drone brood on it. Well, the next frame I pulled it. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold drone brood. Next frame I pulled, pulled drone brood. I was like, oh, great. There's a drone laying queen in there. But anyway, just too much drone brood. Uh, you, you, the more you do, the quicker you get at that. But I'm I'm looking at three frames of brood, and I should see ninety percent worker brood, and I didn't. Uh, so that's that's worker brood, drone brood, and then there's queen cells, right? Hopefully, you don't see a lot of queen cells in your hive, honestly. Uh, uh, but you're looking for them, right? You're 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 looking for them, and maybe you should look at more than three frames during swarm season maybe but yeah, three is probably enough there's three types of there's three types of of uh and, and 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 queen cells look like peanuts basically right they look like a peanut that's hanging uh off the the bottom or or the or the surface of the frame uh, there are swarm cells uh which are planned uh, which are on the bottom of the frame and then there's emergency or supersedure cells, which are more on the face of the frame. And again, the size of the, the cells depend on the nutrition of the colony at the time that they were made. Uh, uh, 16 days till emerge uh, in a queen cell. So sometimes people say, I, I see a queen cell and there's nothing else around it. Well, that's a dead queen cell, right? Because queens emerge at 16 days, workers emerge at 21 days. So if you just see a queen cell and nothing, and it's capped and nothing emerged, then it's it's a dead queen cell uh the queen everybody wants to see their queen uh i do mark my queens uh just because it gives me something to do uh and i'm tend to move quickly so it makes it a little bit easier but maybe i've gotten worse at seeing unmarked queens uh queen is often found on a brood frame uh I use queen excluders. Uh, I run single brood chamber, so I'm only looking through eight to ten frames for the queen. But uh, she could be anywhere. If the if there is a lot of if you're not running a queen excluder, she could be anywhere in the hive. But she does, definitely tends to be on brood frames. Uh, she's about two to three times the size of a worker bee. She's got a hairless thorax, longer legs, and again, a complete hive inspection does not necessarily does not need to see the queen. If you see uh, eggs or if you see young larvae, you have seen enough. Uh, talk a little bit about eggs and larvae really quickly. Uh, they should be pearly white. Uh, they should be single egg or larvae per cell. Whole frame at an angle to see them. Um, they should be ivory white. You want to pay attention to color. You know, we're going to get to disease in a bit, but one of the, one of the, the, characteristics of, of the disease of, of of some of the diseases is that it affects brood right uh, and some of it affects larvae and they're going to make the larvae off colored or or uh off colored or or unusually shaped so you really want to glance at that larvae and make sure it looks exactly like this it should look white ivory white what's this okay so now you're looking and you pull up this brood frame, you're like, holy my, that's not good, right? So you got you got like four, five, six eggs per per cell. Well, you know, that's not normal, right? So that's laying workers, right? So when you see multiple eggs per cell, you got you got problems with that colony. You may not know what to do at first or what to do about it, but you'll at least notice that I have multiple eggs per cell. Now, some people will say, yeah, not always, George, right? So when a queen first starts laying or coming out of winter, sometimes she'll lay two eggs per cell sometimes, but they won't look like this. You won't you won't confuse that situation versus a laying worker situation. So so what's your what's your question? Is your colony queen right? Very important, right? Is my colony queen right? Uh when won't it be quite queen ray post swarm we're not going to talk about post swarm but obviously if it swarms and the queen takes off it's going to be a little bit of time before the new queen starts laying if the queen's injured during an inspection if you see emergency queen cells the queen's not right a failed split you may try to make a split people like making splits are already talking about making splits and for whatever reason that split doesn't work that could be a, a queen 
Queen loss. Laying workers, we talked about. Joan Lane Queen, we didn't talk about. But you want your colony to be queen, right? And if it is not not that perfect management will will make your colony queen, right? But you're more likely to be queen, right? So congrats if you are. <clears throat> this is where I failed miserably this year and multiple times is food. Uh, bees need food. We, we sometimes forget that, right? I mean, they're in a box, but yeah, they need food. And their food depends on what's in the mile radius around the hive, right? So uh, don't don't overlook this important piece of it, right? That that the weather and the conditions sometimes will cause bees not to have enough food. So this is my own pollen sub. I, I was feeding bees like pollen sub. Whoops, pollen sub and one to one. So you can see their little proboscis coming out and they're sucking it up. You know they love food. You know so. You give your bees food, they're happy for sure. So that's um so there's short term food and there's long term food, right? And and where you're gonna see the food is is in the brood nest, the short term food. So their food is basically two things, their nectar, uh, which is liquid, right? Which is their carbohydrate source. So uh, you know, that's that they're getting from flowers. And then there's uh bee bread or, or which is the protein, which is the pollen on the frame. So you have nectar and pollen. Uh, and there should be both of those on the frame. Uh, we, we've definitely come out of a, a, a rough uh, stretch of three weeks of, of basically no foraging. And, and it's amazing. It's amazing. I'm not going to talk much about this, but we, I don't think we appreciate how much bees move sh stuff around the hive, their food sources around the hive to put it where the, the to put it where they need it. It's, it's amazing. 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 You'll have a you'll have a frame of nectar and pollen on position one or two and you go in there a day or two later it'll be gone they'll have taken everything out of that frame and they'll have moved it to where they need it to where the brood is so they're they're constantly a a, a factory going on in there where they need that raw material to survive right they need it to to generate heat they need it to to do their own metabolism they need it to raise brood uh yeah and, and sometimes we're doing uh we're supplementing, right? We, if there's no nectar or bee bread, then we're doing sugar syrup or fondant or sugar bricks or pollen sub or whatever. Uh, and if you want to, again, I talked about that royal jelly. You know, if you see a nice amount of royal jelly in the in the larvae, then you're probably fine. Uh, again, so you're going to see the pollen and the nectar on the outside of that brood nest. So uh, generally right now the brood frames can have some on it but once the brood starts really to pick up there'll be slabs frames full of brood without any uh pollen or nectar on it so you're gonna have to look on the outside frames to see what stores they have the long term is obviously honey uh uh honey reserves are are, are there for 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 not for for uh short-term energy or short-term brood raising they're really there for for the dearth or post honey harvest or winter or starting new colonies and generally honey's above the brood uh or behind the brood but generally above the brood uh this i took this i took unfortunately took uh yesterday so i went into this i, I saw this hive you know i looked outside this hive i was like shoot shoot you know, and some people would say that's poisoning, right? But that's not poison, you know, because the bees are stumbling and there's dead bees at the hive entrance and it looks like the bees have been intoxicated with something. And these bees are starving. So th this is starvation, unfortunately. So this is a hive that that probably was compromised probably for a few days, if not longer, and then just ran out of food yesterday. And uh, I missed it. So this is, this is what you're going to see outside a hive. Uh, on on a starving hive so so food so assess food what your manager says and do i need to feed you probably need to feed when you're starting a new colony i always say when you're when you're starting a package or a new feed them for a couple of weeks probably a good idea especially if you're asking them to draw a comb if there's a dearth, which usually happens in the summer, maybe this year all this rain will cause our clover to bloom basically all summer, and there won't be a summer dearth. We'll see. We don't know. Got to be careful. You, you honey harvesters, me included out there, you got to be careful, right? You got to be careful how much honey you take because they need something. They need something, especially when we're harvesting honey and they're going into that dearth and their colonies are big. Think about it. 
Uh, you, you may need to prep for winter. We're not going to talk about that, but the colonies definitely need so much carbohydrates to survive the winter. And this year coming out of winter in early spring, when, when, when the weather sucks, basically three weeks, you know, two to three weeks of no flight days and cold weather, they're going to run out of food quickly. Uh, no, when there's plenty of food sources in the hive and the sun is shining, you're okay. There's no need to feed or when you, or when you uh, assess the weight of that colony in winter and it's 80, 60, 80 pounds, they're fine. You don't need to feed them. They're going to be okay. Lastly, bees, brood, food, and disease. This is the hardest one for new beekeepers, but it's important. Uh, every every time I'm in a hive, I'm doing an a unconscious or conscious assessment for, for disease. Uh, again, I always tell the residents, you have to look at a lot of normal before able to recognize abnormal. So uh, a, a, a field guide is helpful, you know, so the Penn State puts out this uh, honeybees and their maladies available on Amazon. I think we sell it to at meetings for like 12 or 13 bucks or something like that. Definitely worth having. Uh, I, I think mentoring is key a, a lot. You know, Jeff Eccles coming to inspect my yard. I look forward to it every year because I'm going to learn something about disease recognition uh, from him. Uh, so there's brood, brood diseases and bee diseases. So when you're looking for disease inside of the hive, you want to be looking at brood and at bees. So if you look at the hive on the the, the frame on the left, it, it violates the, the, you know, the first thing I tell you, larvae should be pearly right, white, right? So you're looking at this larvae and it's not white, right? It's like brown, tan. And if you look sort of uh, uh, at some of them, they're not C-shaped. They're kind of like, squat it in the bottom of the cell right so you don't see she shape you don't see pearly white larvae you don't necessarily have to know what this is you just have to know that it's not normal right so i need to sort of take a picture of it with my phone or i need to you know get my guide out to look at what what brood diseases there are but this is european foul brood so the the, the 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 discoloration of the brood and the corkscrew brood is foul brood. Now the the hive on the on the right is uh, 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 another brood disease that that's chalk brood. So chalk brood is something that you'll see in the spring. Sometimes you'll you'll see it when the temperatures are cold and the and the and the bee and the brood is stressed. Uh, again, it looks like chalk basically uh, and, and not normal larvae. So that's chalk brood. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm getting out of this cold. So then you want to look at the, the bees too. And again, you're just scanning. And you're not going to pick this up when you're new. But if you scan enough hives, you're going to pick up things. Now, all, all hives are sick. All hives are sick. All of them. It's just the degree of how sick are they, right? Sort of like me. I've got a cold cough. I'm sick. I'm probably going to live tomorrow because... I don't know why, but so far so good. But, you know, same way with bees, right? You know, all bees, if you look at, if you do PCR on a, on a hive, you're going to see deformed wing virus on low levels in most hives, right? But they're not, you're going to see no zema in most hives. But it's going to be at a level where it's not going to affect the overall bee population and, and cause that hive to crash. But it may if 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 you see a certain number of bees or a certain percent of the bees uh, becoming infected. Now, if you look at the picture on the left, you're going to see that this bee looks different than the rest of the bees, right? So, what do you see? So, you see a bee that's kind of its thorax looks like a queen, right? So it's shiny, right? We already said queen thoraxes are shiny. This all the other workers, well, most of the other workers have hairy thoraxes. This queen is this worker bee, not a queen. Worker bee's got a, a thin. Uh, a, oh my goodness, I cough too hard and I compromised blood flow to my brain. Has a has a shiny thorax, so that's abnormal. If you look at this this uh, worker bee's abdomen, it's sort of short and stunted, and it looks greasy. And, and you can see that there's a there's sort of a bee on the bottom left that's sort of working on looking like this too. This is something called chronic bee paralysis. So this is a chronic viral, uh, is it viral? I think it's viral infection. Uh, usually you'll see a few bees like this, but sometimes it can it can really overtake a hive. Greasy, shiny, hairless bees. You think chronic bee paralysis. This is not going to be a talk on chronic bee paralysis. But it's a talk on on making disease as part of your hive inspection. This one uh, on the on the right, you could see the the bee in the middle, right? That's a 
Hopefully you guys don't see much of this. Uh, uh, this is a uh, deformed wing virus, right? So you're going to see these wings that are that are really shriveled uh, up, and and that's just a very sick bee that can't fly. Uh, you may when you start to see a bunch of deformed wing virus, you definitely should be concerned that that uh, that your your bees are going to be in trouble. So again, when you're looking for disease, you're looking at you're looking at brood, and you're looking at bees. But the most important thing to to screen for disease is to know your mite count, it, it is to is to measure mites, and and you really should be measuring mites once a month, starting in May, maybe June, definitely, maybe May. Uh, it's simple to do. Uh, there's no reason not to do it. Um, it's gonna really it's really gonna give you the information you need to not fall behind on disease in your hive, right? So uh, there's lots of, of videos out there on how to do a mite count. I use uh, Dawn dish soap, one tablespoon per half gallon of water. I used isopropyl alcohol for a long time, but Dawn dish soap seems to work and everything in beekeeping is getting more expensive. So I go with the Dawn dish soap method. You basically collect half a cup of bees in a mite washer. You cover the bees with the wash liquid, you swirl for a minute, and then you count the total number of mites on the bottom of a cup and divide by three to get percent mites, number of mites per 100 bees. Simple. Again, we'll probably have more tutorials in May and June about how to do this, but once you do it once, it's simple. Uh, so really, when you think about disease, I mean, you can see all kinds of things, but really it comes down to what's your mite count and do I treat? So if your mite count's greater than 2%, which would be six mites on a mite count, you definitely should treat. If it's between one to 2%, it sort of depends on what season you're in and beekeeper preference. If you're less than 1%, probably no. And if you're at 0%, congrats. Your, your hive's doing really well not to have any mites on a mite wash. Uh, Again, monthly thing, May, June, July, August, September, October. There are some people that, me included, that universally treat independent of mite counts. I don't think it's the right thing to do. I think the right thing to do is do mite counts monthly. Even if you're going to universally treat, you should know what your mite counts are. Most hives die from high mites and their viruses, right? So if, if you know your mite counts low, you're going you're gonna to be assured that your hive is probably going to survive. So in summary, every hive inspection, you need to assess four things, bees, brood, food, and disease. And you're trying to answer four questions. Is the size of my hive appropriate for the size of the colony? Is my colony queen right? Does the colony need to be fed? And what is the mite count? And is an intervention needed? And when you do this enough and get good at it, and this takes time, you're not going to go out there tomorrow and do the world's best hive inspection, but you're going to have a framework of which to build it. And if you do it, your beekeeping becomes enjoyable, effective, and efficient, and you have fun. Otherwise, you kind of spin in circles like the resident. I hate being on call because I don't know what I'm doing, and Dr. Data is as mean as they come. You know, I was like, no, I just need you to be organized. That's all. I don't want to come in at 2 a.m., but I will hold your hand if I need to. You know, So uh, I, I think that's uh, a wrap. For this and, and hopefully uh it was enjoyable and effective and somewhat efficient talk tonight so i'm gonna open it up to to question newbie here Are videos online for us to access later some are i talked to mark this is being recorded uh we are working on a website refresh uh so uh stay tuned and it will be easier to access everything that we have because we have a lot of good resources that are just hard to access Sheena said, hi, Bloom, for, for our, 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 our app on our phone. Uh, yes, it's being recorded. Uh, what's the difference between royal jelly and what they feed to a queen to be? Nothing. So everything gets fed royal jelly for the first day, right? So even worker, even worker brood gets fed a little, little bit of royal jelly. What makes something a queen is that that larvae continues to get fed royal jelly for basically the next five days. Uh, and, and that is what turns it into a queen. So there's uh, versus just worker food. Uh, so it's just a different thing. They, everything is fed work royal jelly for the first 24 hours. 
queens are continued fed royal jelly. What do you do if you have too much drone, mini drone brood? Really, you have to ask yourself if you're queen right, right? And why do you have so much? If you have more than 10 to 20, if you have more than 10% or 15% drone brood, you have to ask yourself if you're queen right. Uh, thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. Uh, I yeah. did go into my hives today. <laughs> Unfortunately, the weak one did die. I think it was too moist in there. The other Not one. Bees. Pardon me? Not enough bees. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was that way since last fall. Yeah. Yeah. So the other one, it's an A-frame. And the bees seem to be, you know, okay now. They were, I don't know, uh, I, it's only two deep, one, I mean, two boxes, one deep, one medium. And I basically the medium is a honey super on top. The sure. problem is there's bees in there. They're active. Should the queen be laying by now? Because I couldn't find any evidence of laying in. Of course, I didn't see the queen. Yeah, no, the queen definitely, you definitely should have brood in the hives at this point, you know. So if you're if your hive has no brood in it, I would be suspicious that you you're not queen right. Uh, uh yeah, so I don't, you know, I had a hive. It's interesting. I had a I had a hive that came out of winter that did the same thing. And I didn't I didn't have a queen to fix it. So I I, I don't know. I just ignored it. I was like, it's gonna turn into a laying worker. I should shake it out. But you know what? It eventually dwindled and it never turned into a laying worker. It just dwindled. You know, and I don't know why these workers never decided. I mean, there was no brood pheromone, right? But why did why did these winter bees, right? Because they they the queen died at some point in the winter. Why did these winter bees not start laying unfertilized eggs? I don't know the answer. So I suspect, Bernadette, that you have the same situation. But I so, don't know why you don't why they're not turning into laying workers. And I don't know. I've never really thought about it that much. Do, do winter bees? I would assume winter bees have the capability. They have ovaries. They, I assume they have the capability of lay to laying unfertilized eggs. But I don't know why they don't. But I would assume your hive is queenless, Bernadette. Okay, so you think that it's just uh, the um, bees left over from overwintering that are still in there, and as I said, it's not booming. You know, but there were like three or four, three or four seams of bees in there, and uh, but they seem healthy. It's just I cannot find any brood at all. I of course can't see, um, yeah, you uh, eggs, and I don't think I saw a larva. And if I did, there was like less than a handful. Yeah, I assume you're queenless. Sorry, Bernadette. Okay, thank you, George. When is it too late to get a nuke? It's never too late to get a nuke, Elizabeth. So you can, you can, uh, you, you, you they're, they're, the nukes, you know, all the bees that are being, most of them, not all, but a lot of the bees that are available now, packaged in nukes are coming from the South, right? Because they're ahead of us, you know, so they're able to raise queens and, and their bees start kicking up in January or early February where ours, you know, take longer, but There'll be nukes available, local nukes available, probably in May and June, probably for cheaper than or equal price to what's coming up from the south. So if you're if you're up for up for waiting until May or June, which is prime swarm season and queen rearing season around here, you can get some local nukes uh, up here at any point. So, yeah. And, 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 you know, we'll go into making your own nukes, right? So, again, I didn't do that as well as I should. I have too much on my plate, maybe. But June is the month where, where, where we really focus on making splits and making nukes to overwinter up here. So, you know, that you, have, you always have that extra hive in your apiary just in case, right? Even with good informative inspection, sometimes our management is not ideal. So it's always nice to have a nuke or two as, as in your back pocket. So... You're never totally bee-less coming out of winter. What do you do with package bee boxes? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you do with a package bee box. Uh, anyone have any suggestions on what to do with a package bee box? You can unmute yourself or you can type it in the comments. I don't know. I guess you could save it and make your own packages, I guess. You could... Or I wonder if you could turn them into uh, nests for um, uh, local, you know, 
bees, the uh, not the honey bees, but the other uh, native bees. Give them back to the vendor, Tim Murray said. That, you could ask Frank if he wants them or whoever you got them from. That's a good suggestion. I'm gonna I'm gonna text Frank back and see if he wants them. George, you can also what? you can you also say George, you can also save those B, you know, those B packages. And mm -hmm. if you have to sort of balance out hives, you've got mm -hmm. more foragers in one, you can shake them into that that box and then transfer them to another yard and use them cool. that way. Be a little transport box. What is a quiet box? A quiet box is basically a nuke box with a hardware cloth on the bottom. So it's basically just a, a, a an extra box that you bring with you to do your hive inspections. Where if you <laughs> pull a frame and the queen's on it, you just stick you stick that frame in the in the quiet box. So it's safe while you do the rest of your inspection. So I I. I think I, I picked up that term from someone. I don't know if that's a universally thing or that's a local thing that they call it a quiet box. I'm not sure. But that's not that that was stolen from a, a previous beekeeper in the CCBA. So uh, well, Bill Scott says he uses packages. Thanks, Bill, uh, in the garden to put my sprinkler on to get them higher than the greenery. Quiet crowd tonight. I worry about that. I hope this was helpful. I had a question with, yes. about um, identification. Um, you recommended that that Penn State field guide. Is there other resources that anybody might might have to help somebody become better at identifying drones versus workers versus different you know larva stages? You know, there's the Be Informed Partnership. I don't know if they still exist. Um. But that's a good website that they have a lot of visuals on there. Uh, you got some, Dan. Anybody else have thoughts? You can go to University of Guelph, G-U-E-L-P-H, University of Guelph. They have a lot. They're a university in Canada, and they do a lot of bee education videos that are really well done. So if you're looking at if you're looking for quality, you know, sort of sound uh, stuff related to bees, that's another good place to go. Uh, uh, what's it? Uh, do Doctor Dewey, who who talked has a has a great book out, a visual sort of atlas like book uh, on bees. Uh, uh, Dewey Karen. Karen, yes, thank you. Uh, that sounded like uh, Donna. Don Donna, Donna, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I recognize that B chat voice. Yeah, Dewey Karen, <laughs> Honey Bee. I forget what his book is called. Honey Bee Biology. Honey Bee Biology. I think that's a really strong book with a nice amount of visuals in it. I I, I really strongly encourage people to get local mentors. You know, like I think that that's just a a uh, huge uh, way to to learn anything, right? Uh, I'd like to think I taught some residents something over three years, you know. But uh, yeah, it's it's that work individually with the with the mentor that's key. Talk, can you talk about when to move resource frames around? Yeah, so I was doing that today. Uh, uh, you know, you can as long you can move food frames and brood frames between hives. Uh, you don't want to move queens between hives, but once you sort of have your queen identified and 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 in a quiet box, you can move whatever you want between hives. So, surely, when you're doing your assessment and you're and you're seeing if, if if the hives have enough brood or enough food, if they don't, you know, one of the one of the interventions that you could do is take from a strong and give to a weak, and, and that's a really effective thing to do right now because you're you're making the weak a little bit stronger. And the strong, you're sort of delaying the swarm impulse a little bit by stealing some brood out of the strong and giving it to the weak. So feel free. The only thing you, <laughs> the only thing you got to be careful of one is not to move the queen, and two is not to move disease around. Right. So usually the disease pressure is pretty low in 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 March and April, uh, but you just got to be aware that you know you could be moving a small hive beetle infested frame from one hive to another hive, or you could be moving a frame of uh, a completely packed with mites from one hive to the other hive. Again, that's not a huge concern in March and April as it is later in the season. But yeah, no, it's a great way when you're doing your 
brood inspection and you notice something that's a little deficient in one hive, how to how to boost it up without with just taking from the strong and giving to the to the less strong. I hope that answers that question. Can you freeze mites? If you find you, you have a frame of mites and you don't want to get rid of everything, can you frame? Can you freeze it? Yeah, I mean, peep, that's what people do with their drone comb, IPM drone comb, right? So they, they put drone comb in their hive, right? And they wait until all the drone drones are all capped. And then they pull that frame out yeah. and basically just freeze it, right? So they kill all the mites on that drone comb by freezing it. So... It, it's 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 a really effective way at at, at least early on to de to decrease your your mite burden in your hive you know by doing drone comb I, I I don't do it but if I <coughs> if I had two or three hives I would for sure yes but you're also going to kill everything so do you really want to do you really want to take a frame of worker brood and freeze it probably not this time of year right or any time of year because you're just gonna you're just gonna set that high back you know if, if you do that so but yes for the drone comb absolutely as soon as it's capped freeze it put it in the freezer for two days all the mites will be dead take it out put it back in the hive and they'll uncap it clean out all the dead pupae and and relay in it yeah absolutely smart it's a really smart thing to do honestly smart i don't do it i'm not smart <laughs> lazy anyway we got 12 more minutes i didn't want to keep people past nine if there's other other questions you have any questions or any other thoughts or i'll take some thought you know um uh, if you want if you if if you want to send me uh, send me an email or or give me your thoughts on what you thought of this useful or not useful you don't have to but Again, this is the second time I'm doing this. I'm I'm trying to work on making it a little bit better because I think it's an important. I think this organization of your approach on a hive inspection is really important, you know. And I hear it on B chat on Friday night sometimes. Like Bernadette did did a great exam. She 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 did great tonight. She said, you know, I got a I got a hive. The size is a deep and a medium. It's got three frames of bees and no brood. Right? I mean, that's perfect. That's a perfect. A plus description of a hive inspection, right? She covered the bees, she covered the brood, she covered the hive size, she covered the food. And then I was able to pretty confidently say, Bernadette, I don't think you got a queen, right? So it's it's amazing when you can get your before you close up, just practice it. Before you close up that hive, can I tell if if I was somebody was if I was on B chat on Friday night, could I tell somebody what was going on in that high from bees, brood, food, and disease? You know, what, what, what is it? And, and do I need to change anything? And B, I'm, I'm, I'm still working on not, I'm lazy a little bit, but be proactive. You know, if you have a question, do something about it. You know what I mean? Like, don't, if you, if you think you should feed, feed. If you think you should downsize, downsize. If you think you should might treat, might treat, you know? if you think you're queenless maybe wait a week or two <laughs> and then put a new queen in or then put a frame of eggs in you know we're not going into all the details but i encourage people if you're not sure of the answers to these questions do something i always tell the residents at night the kid's in the hospital he's sick do something i'd rather have you do something and be wrong than do nothing and be doubly wrong you know what i mean just know what you're doing have an assessment do something and then you'll learn, right? Because if you act, if you did your assessment and you actioned on your assessment and you were wrong, you'll learn. Or if you're right, you'll learn. You know, but you'll learn. If you do nothing, you you I, I feel like I'm back lecturing people at 3 a.m. in the morning doing doing uh doing call. But yeah, you'll learn, you know. Okay, That's follow up question then, George. Yes, um the hive was fine last year, it was productive. Uh, when I went, you know, I did the dribble every time I checked it, uh, it was good. Now it sounds like the queen is gone. So what happened to her? Yeah, no. So she got lost some point during the winter, I assume. Did she get too old? Did, I mean, you know. Yeah. And they probably tried to replace her at some, or maybe she got, maybe she died during the winter and there were no eggs in the winter. You know, did, did did she die in the winter or did she, 
I mean, it obviously had a good population of bees in it if it survived this long, right? So she must have been there in the fall, you know, so she laid her winter bees, right? Yeah. But did they try to supersede her late and then the and then the supersedure failed? <clears throat> or did she or did she just die over the winter and then yeah, and I, mean, I, I guess the they, yeah. workers. I don't know Bernadette, but yeah, my I, follow had, I had a hive that did the same thing. You know, it it came out of I, my first inspection was early. I said it had no brood, and I and I said shoot. You know, I mean, even they even then they should have had some brood. And I looked at it like a week or two later, and it still had no brood. And I'm like, uh, and I was like, oh, where's the laying workers? And it never happened. But I don't know. It it I, I obviously she made a lot of bees. She made her winter bees, and then she disappeared and they weren't able to requeen themselves. Yeah. You know? So I guess I was asking earlier, what's the critical cutoff point? Like when do I decide I've given it enough of a chance and it's time to requeen? Should I give her another week? Should I do it right now? You I know? don't think, I think it's a lost cause burn that because you have okay. to think to yourself, you know, when you're queenless, I hate to be negative, but when you're queenless and you're queenless for that long, you don't have, not only don't you have a queen, but you don't have any young bees in there either, right? So if you put a right. queen in there and the queen starts to lay, who's going to, who's going to take, who's going to feed them and who's going to, you know, who's going to, to, to nurture those larvae and feed those larvae and who's going to forage. It's just, it, you, you not only at this point, not only do you have not have a queen problem, but you also have a, 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 a unbalanced population of bees. You basically got a, a whole bunch of grandmother bees that have survived the winter who are basically just hanging on, but aren't going to be, aren't going to be useful to a, to a new queen. I don't think. Okay. That helps George. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I hate to be negative Bernadette. No, no, it's reality. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I have one surviving hive, so I might as well do something about it. Thank you. Yeah. I have a neighbor that, uh, has the insecticide guy come in and she doesn't inform me. And I, I know I've lost a hive or two from uh, poisoning from that. So I'm, I've asked her to tell me a day before, and I'm thinking I can throw a net over the bees and keep them in for that, for the day. Is that a good thing to do or would it be safer to move the hive at night? No, I think if you can keep them in there for a day, I think that's great. I I, I don't know much about spraying and, and and colony management around spraying spraying because I'm not in a I I'm not in a high agricultural area, Jim. So I'm not sure honestly. So that may be a question for B Chat on Friday night when somebody else who has more experience with that 